they'll be hyped up, but it's not like they're getting a lot of love right now. You know, I mean, this would probably be one of those situations where they'll vault into the top 15 or so. I, I don't know. I mean, they're not going to vault into the top 10. I mean, I, I think there's... It, it just depends on how they look. I mean, if they go out and they dominate, then sure. Then I think the people will react strongly to them. Hello and welcome to Always College Football. Today is Friday, October 7th. We appreciate you being with us. We have a great weekend of college football games coming up this weekend. We're going to break them all down. All of the top 10 games that we felt like were worthy of a breakdown are going to get broken down. You're going to sit there and say, well, you're missing some notables. Yeah, because I don't know if they're going to be competitive. That's why we're skipping them. So we're going to talk about the competitive games, and then we'll kind of break down on Monday some of the games that might not be as competitive going into the weekend. That's why we have our Gimme 5, the five biggest games of the weekend, and the five games that could potentially be highly entertaining, even if they're not necessarily playing for a whole lot. Still fun to us because we love the game. We love the competition. Please like, rate, and subscribe. It helps us out. It helps the show out. We look forward to to interacting with you on whether that's the ESPN YouTube channel or if it's with us here on the podcast, whether that's on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, very, very helpful. Like, rate, subscribe. Like I said, helps us out. I'm Greg McElroy. With me as always, Drax Trail, Jack Foster, and the other guy, Kubiak, is here as well. We have a great game plan in store. We're going to break down all those games. It should be an awesome, awesome show. So without much further ado, let's get into these matchups. Let's talk about it. Every college football season, Goodyear knows the importance of winning on the road. The road will always demand confidence, the confidence to handle whatever the journey brings and to perform under tough conditions. And just like the players and the fans of college football, Goodyear is ready. Are you ready for the road? Visit Goodyear.com to find the right Goodyear tires for whatever road you're on this season. Goodyear, more driven. All right, let's get into it. It's Gimme 5. We do it every single Friday, breaking down the five biggest games of the weekend. You're probably going to look at our five and say, really, those are your top five? Well, there's a few games that we think could have huge ramifications down the road, which is exactly why we're putting them in our Gimme 5. For instance, number five, North Carolina traveling to Miami. You're going to sit there and say, really? Miami? What they've done? Didn't they just lose to Middle Tennessee? Yes, all that's accurate, coming off a of bye week, all this other stuff. But I actually think the winner of this game could potentially be the ACC Coastal Champions. That's why, if you look at the numbers, and like I'm not all into the FPI and you know the statistics and the projections and all this stuff, but the statistics actually back this up. Miami is the lone ACC team so far that's yet to play a conference game. So we're going to find out exactly where they're at. But currently, right now, According to most models' projections, Miami actually still has the highest chance to win the Coastal Division. Why is that? I'm not sure, but that's what the models indicate as of right now. Meanwhile, North Carolina is the second highest chance of winning the Coastal, and the winner of this game will actually have a greater than 50% chance of getting to the ACC Championship game. So this is actually a very important game in regards to conference championship status. Now, North Carolina is actually 3-0 and under Mac Brown. And they, of course, they're trying to go for four straight. And that would be the longest win streak by either team in series history. So possibility of pretty significant feat there if Mac Brown can get to 4-0 and against the Hurricanes. Of course, the different Hurricane group, obviously different coach, different staff, all this other stuff. But either way, let's talk about North Carolina's offense going against Miami's defense. Drake May has been off the charts good, dude. This guy is phenomenal. Uh, not only has he been great throwing the football, he's accounted for 22 touchdowns overall, 19 passing touchdowns, three rushing touchdowns, but he only has just one interception. So he's making great decisions as well. If you look at his total QBR, all the numbers support his efficiency. And I think he's going to be going against a defense that is somewhat gettable. However, I mean, the numbers would indicate that Miami's still pretty good. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. But man, the last time out, they gave up four plays that went for at least 69 yards against Middle Tennessee State. Not good, right? They are a big play offense, North Carolina is, and if they can create the same type of explosiveness against Miami, then it could be tough sledding for the Hurricanes. The one thing Miami is doing well is they're generating an awful lot of pressure. 38% of opponents' dropbacks 
are being faced with pressure. That's the highest rate in the ACC, and that's the sixth highest rate in the FBS. Now, Drake May has still been pretty good, even while under duress. So he has yet to throw an interception. He's got five touchdowns under duress. And I think that that's something that needs to be taken into account. This young man that hasn't played a ton of football at this level, he's only a redshirt freshman, but he has handled pressure extremely well. The other thing, too, Miami's done very well this year is they've been pretty good against the run. They're the second best team in the ACC, allowing less than three yards per carry. Clemson's the best. They're sitting there at 2.4. Miami's the second best in regards to yard uh, rush defense. They're allowing 2.8 yards per carry. So we'll see whether or not that gives because we all know what happened a couple years back. The last time North Carolina visited Miami, what they run for? 544. That's right, 544. Javante Williams, Michael Carter, pretty dang good one-two punch. Of course, I don't think that Miami fans have forgotten that performance. More on Miami's defense down the road, but we'll figure them out down the road. I don't know where they're at exactly right now. Are they good? Are they bad? Are they okay? I'm not sure. We'll find out. I do think Miami's offense has their issues. Now, they've been without top two running backs, top two wide receivers, and a tight end. So they've been without a lot of playmakers. There's some rumors that they might be getting healthier this week coming off the bye. Not sure at this point what the availability will be for some of those guys that are missing some time. Van Dyke has been the main issue at quarterback. Last year, he was awesome. This year, not so much. He's posted a 41, 41 total QBR this season. That's 12th out of 14 in the ACC. Think about that. This guy was talked about being a first round pick and he's 12th out of 14 in the ACC. And if you look at how he played against Middle Tennessee, uh, it was probably his worst performance of the year, if we're going to be completely honest. It was his lowest QBR total as a starter. And he will have an opportunity now to rebound against a defense that has been extremely gettable this year. North Carolina struggled. However, North Carolina, the last time out against Virginia Tech, and granted, take it with a grain of salt, it's Virginia Tech. They finally looked halfway decent on that side of the ball. Now, a lot was talked about in the offseason. The hire of Jane Chiswick it did not pay dividends in the first few games. But last week, maybe they're taking to take they're starting to take strides in the right direction. They allowed Grant Wells uh, last week just to throw for 139 passing yards. So maybe they're taking steps. Uh, I do think that Van Dyke needs to be more aggressive. He's not taking the shots downfield that he was attempting last year. Of course, Josh Gaddis, new offensive coordinator. Maybe they're just not meshing all that well right now, but Van Dyke looks at times apprehensive when it comes to cutting it loose. A little bit like Spencer Rattler last year prior to him getting replaced. So hopefully, hopefully Van Dyke can come out of his funk because the kid's a very, very talented player. I lean North Carolina in the game because I haven't seen enough from Miami, but either way, this will be a very important game here when it comes to deciding the division. If it's North Carolina that wins, like how does Mario Cristobal kind of rally the fan base and the team to pick up for the rest of November in the year after a three game losing streak. Nobody really saw coming. Ain't, ain't going to happen this year. I mean, it, it, well, I mean, the fan I mean, they base, were ranked 16 though. I mean, so they, they, people think in Van Dyke coming back and like all these things were coming out, but I don't know. So you have a, what do you see from them if they lose this game? I mean, they're in trouble. I mean, but it's a transition year. I mean, it's year one of a new, of a new regime. Um, I'm not going to really evaluate where, where Cristobal is right now based on what he's done through five games in the year. Like It's been bad, sure. The performance against Middle Tennessee defensively was awful. The performance against a and offensively was awful. Maybe they can get things going in the right, right direction. But at this point, man, I have low expectations for what I'm seeing from Miami. Uh, maybe they can get back on track. I hope they can uh, because we had all left you know, Notre Dame for dead and the get-right recipe was playing against... North Carolina. So we'll see. Fingers crossed that things can get going in the right direction for the Hurricanes. Let's move on to game number four, Florida State at NC State. This is the bounce back bowl. Okay. Florida State's offense right now, Jordan Travis is having a great year. We've seen what he's been able to do. And if you look at what he's done up to this point, he's actually on pace to have the best season for an FSU quarterback, and they've had a couple good ones, might add. There have been, been some pretty subpar ones, I might add, as well. But it's on pace for the best season by a Florida State quarterback since Jameis Winston won the Heisman in 2013. So statistically speaking, things are looking good for the quarterback spot. He's coming off of his two best single games in terms of passing yardage, and he's really started to have some wide receivers and some weapons 
emerged as a really solid receiving core when last year you could make the case it was the worst in the ACC. This year you can make the case it's the best in the ACC. So a lot to really account for when evaluating these players. Now, I don't know if they are the best, but they certainly can make a case for it with what Micah Pittman's done last week. A couple touchdowns, five catches. He's starting to come on as a nice catch and run option. Johnny Wilson, of course, his length. He had six catches for a touchdown, 85 yards, plus what he did a couple weeks ago against Louisville. You see the weapons that are starting to come to the forefront for this passing attack. Of course, ultimately, Florida State's always going to be about running the football. Their offensive line needs to be better. They've been a little banged up there on both lines of scrimmage. Hopefully, they'll be better against a really good NC State defense. Meanwhile, NC State offensively, they have been substandard, really substandard based on what we thought they were going to be coming into the season. Now, they got to get things going. If you look at this, they've really struggled this year in their two games against Power 5 competition. They've managed to average just 23.5 points per game and 274 yards per game. That's a scary thought. Now, Clemson's defense is legit. Let's take that into account. Texas Tech is not legit on the defense side of the football. They're good. They're fine. They're all right. But it's not like we've seen a whole lot from NC State offensively. Their yards per game mark against Power 5 opponents is 100th in college football. That's the lowest among teams that are currently ranked. All right. So far, they rank 95th nationally in yards per play at just 5.4 yards per play. They have very few explosive plays, just 19 plays that have gone for more than 20 yards. That's also 95th in college football. All right. They got to get things going. Devin Leary, yes, he's got 10 touchdowns, but eight of those have come either against FCS teams in Charleston Southern. He threw four against them or UConn. He threw four against them. All right. Both those teams, obviously, not great competition. Combined against East Carolina, Texas Tech, and Clemson, he's thrown just two touchdowns against two interceptions. So what gives? He's also only completing 58% of his passes against quality competition as well. So now I, I look at where they're at. They're struggling, I think, when it comes to running the football. Uh, they had just 34 yards last week against Clemson. And they also only accounted for 279 yards offensively. So they really got to get things going. Thayer Thomas is emerging as a guy that can certainly be relied upon. Devin Carter, I think, is a really good, solid piece at wide receiver. But that group has struggled to be able to replicate the success of what Emeka Amezi was able to provide this offense last year. They got to get things going. For Florida State, they got to be better on third down. Wake Forest was able to extend drives. They went 10 of 18 on third down. And Florida State, for the most part, really didn't do a great job on critical down and distance last week either. They were just 4 of 11. So the other thing for Florida State, they got to knock off the penalties. People and Florida State fans have said, well, you know, if you look at the game, I mean, Wake Forest didn't get called on things they should have been called on. While I don't entirely disagree, I also think ultimately when you look in the mirror, you can say, well, Wake Forest should have been called for things. Sure, that's fine. But still... Florida State can clean up a lot when it comes to penalties. They had 11 penalties for 96 yards last week. That can't happen against quality competition. I lean Florida State in this game. I think they're better on offense, and I think they're fine on defense. And yet, until I see Devin Leary, and until I see this offense pick things up, they're just difficult to trust. I think their defense is great, but I really don't trust their offense, and I don't trust their run game. I think their offensive line so far this year has been, for the most part, very disappointing. All right, moving on to game number three. It's Utah at UCLA. Massive game out West. The first ever ranked matchup between Utah and UCLA. And if you look at the Pac-12 this year, all right, you look at the quarterback play in the Pac-12 this year, everyone seems to be talking about Caleb Williams. Everyone's just talking about how he's going to be in New York for the Heisman Trophy. Fine, I'm good with all that. You know I like and respect Caleb Williams very much. But you know who's one and two? Right now, in total QBR, that would be Cam Rising and Dorian Thompson Robinson. In conference play, Cam Rising has a 95.7 total QBR. DTR, I might add, 92.3. You know where Caleb Williams is? 83.5. So not only are they one and two, but they're one and two by a fairly wide margin. It's fairly significant when you take all that into consideration. Now, Utah over the course of time, has not been great against UCLA. They're 8-11, and 11, but they've won the last five against the Bruins. 
The only longer winning streak in the series belongs to UCLA. That was when they won the first eight games of the series between 1933 and 2006. So if you want to go back over the course of eight decades, yeah, sure, UCLA might have had Utah's number. But in recent times, it has not been as favorable for the Bruins. Now, when you look at Utah, they fare very well in ranked matchups. In the AP poll era, in ranked matchups, when Utah is the higher ranked team, they are 5-1. and one. Okay, I think that's fairly significant when you think about where they're at. The other thing I'd say about this, if Utah, and we know Utah is a really good team at home, Utah on the road, not great. All right, let's just assume Florida finishes strong, right? Just assume Florida goes on and, and plays fine down the stretch and, and all is well and good in Gatorland. Well, assuming that Florida finishes strong, Utah has gone just 2-8 and eight in its last 10 games away from home against teams that finished with a winning record. Think about that. Two and eight away from home against teams that finished with a winning record. Now, I think Florida is going to finish with a winning record, and I'm fairly certain that UCLA is going to finish with a winning record as well. So Utah has not been great on the road. This should set up nicely for them. However, we kind of documented UCLA's home field advantage, not great, but either way, this is still, I think, going to be a difficult task for Utah to go on the road and to play against a team that is feeling really good about where they're at. UCLA, I think, is a resilient bunch too. If Utah, for whatever reason, comes out of the gate strong, and they very well might. I mean, Utah is a very good starting football team. And if UCLA finds themselves trailing, that's fine. Dating back to last year, the Bruins have won six straight games when they've trailed at some point in the game. That's tied for the longest active streak in the FBS, the team that they're tied with, Coastal Carolina. So they also won each of the last three games when trailing by double digits, which is the longest in the FBS as well. So even if they get down, don't fret UCLA. This team has a certain resiliency about them and being able to bounce back and climbing back into games that feel like they're going a little bit sideways. Now, Utah's a tough football team. We know that their production is going to be extremely good. They're leading the Pac-12 in total defense. They're second in the nation against the pass. They don't give up a whole lot of yards on the ground either. UCLA have been a huge part of their success, and their 5-0 and start has been turning people over. They've forced 11 so far, including two against Washington, but Utah has only given it up four times. They haven't suffered multiple turnovers in any one game. So uh, it's it's been a while since Utah has kind of struggled from a turnover standpoint. Of course, they struggled against Florida early in the season with turnovers as well. So when you look at everything... They had the one turnover against Florida, but they also had that goal line stand too. So that's kind of like two turnovers there for Utah either way. I think it's going to be huge for UCLA to stay on schedule. They've been really good. They don't really give up a lot of lost yardage plays. They've been able to stay on schedule. Charbonnet is phenomenal. I think Dorian Thompson Robinson is excellent as well. I'm leading UCLA in this game, shockingly enough. I love Utah, always love Utah, but I think UCLA is the hot hand right now. And the focus that I saw from that team against a Washington football team that I'm still not 100% sure on has me feeling good enough about the Bruins to be able to pull off the upset at home. I like the Bruins. I don't feel great about it, but I like the Bruins in what should be a very important game in the Pac-12 standings. You don't feel great about it. What's the scale? One to 10? Like, where are we on? Like, how like a three. With the Bruins? Picking against three? Utah, to me, is always dangerous. Like, I really like Utah. I always like Utah. This year is no different. Another thing that I always like is the Red River Showdown slash rivalry slash shootout. All right. I've been calling it the Red River Shootout all week. That's what I grew up calling it. I got to be careful. I'm calling this game. So if I say Red River Shootout on national television, I might get in trouble. So I'm going to call it the Red River Showdown and we're going to practice together here on Always College Football. All right. For the first time since 1998, just the third time in 50 years, both Texas and Oklahoma come into this game unranked. The Longhorns have won each of the last four games when the teams were unranked. They're also favored by north of a touchdown in this one. So something maybe to consider when looking at the trends and the historical significance of these teams being unranked. But since 2014, no series in college football has been more dramatic. All right. Eight of the last nine meetings between these two teams have been decided by one possession, the lone exception being the 2018 Big 12 championship game. So every game that's been played in the historic Cotton Bowl one possession football game. Now, this could have still a fairly significant impact on the Big 12 championship race. Now, 
I know that both these teams already have a loss. Oklahoma actually has two. But with a win, Oklahoma can get back in the good graces and essentially eliminate Texas from Big 12 contention because they have a game and a half lead because they have the head-to-head. And then obviously, if Texas wins, Oklahoma with three losses is all for, I mean, for the most part, done when it comes to the Big 12 championship race. So a very significant game for both teams in regards to getting their first goal done in the year, and that's to win or get to the Big 12 championship game. Let's talk about Oklahoma for a second. Talk about last week's performance. It was a really ugly performance. There's no denying that. They give up 55 points. It's the second most allowed in a game by the Sooners against an unranked opponent in their program history. All right, they gave up 59 to Texas Tech back in 2016. But you know who the quarterback was at Texas Tech? That'd be Pat Mahomes. Giving up that many points to Pat Mahomes, as we've now found out, is nothing to be ashamed of. All right, but you look at the quarterback situation of both places. That's obviously significant. Quinn Ewers coming off an injured shoulder. Thought he might play last week. Is he cleared this week? We'll find out. All signs and all indicators point to him starting the game this week against Oklahoma. Will there be rust? We'll find out. I think it's something significant to monitor. If for whatever reason he can't go, Hudson Card's been just fine in relief over the last few weeks. And then for Oklahoma, Dylan Gabriel went out with 940 left in the second quarter against TCU. He got hit. He's been going through concussion protocol. Still TBD on his availability. If he can't go, it'll be some blend of Davis Bevel or could potentially be General Booty as well. We'll find out exactly what it looks like last year. Last week, excuse me, it was Davis Bevel. They had 190 yards of total offense when Dylan Gabriel was in the game. So just around 20 minutes of game time. In the final 40 minutes of game time, they were able to muster just 165. So clearly, Dylan Gabriel, very important to the success of the Oklahoma offense. Let's talk quickly about Oklahoma's defense against Texas's offense. We all know that Oklahoma's defense is one of the worst in the Big 12, at least up to this point. The last two games, they've allowed 509 yards against Kansas State and 668 yards against TCU. Not good. The 1,177 yards are allowed are the fifth most the Sooners have ever given up in any two-game stretch in the last 15 seasons. So something very, very significant. The most problematic, I think, for Oklahoma, though, have been the yards given up on the ground. 275 yards in back-to-back games for the first time in the Big 12 era. And I think what's most scary about that is that quarterback run game, both Max Duggan and Adrian Martinez for TCU and Kansas State, respectively, they've gotten a lot of yards themselves. The good news is Quinn Ewers nor Hudson Card are really careful capable of really taking over the game with their legs. So maybe that'll be a little bit easier to manage. Bad news is you have to go against Bijan Robinson. And we all know what Bijan Robinson's all about. He's accounted for nearly a third of Texas's yards from scrimmage, whether it be running it or catching it. Bijan Robinson is kind of in a class of his own when it comes to being effective at running back there in college football. Now you also have to account for Xavier Worthy, and you have to account for Jeff Tavion Sanders. Worthy's an excellent receiver. Sanders is an unbelievable tight end. He's got three touchdown receptions already this year and was a big featured player in their most recent game against West Virginia. Right now, I think it's going to be very, very interesting. I'm, of course, calling the game, like I said, so I won't make a pick. I won't make a lean, but I think it's going to be a really interesting game because I don't think Oklahoma's anywhere near as bad as they showed the last couple of weeks. And I still think there's some question marks about Texas on both sides of the ball. Should be an awesome one there in Dallas. I can't wait to be there. There's a bucket list game for me. I'm thrilled and honored to have the opportunity to be a part of the call alongside Joe Tessitore and Katie George. Finally, game number one. It's the best game of the weekend in my eyes. A very impactful game, I might add, as well. Ultimately, will it factor into who goes to Atlanta for the SEC championship game? I I don't think so. But still, it's a highly entertaining game. Vegas agrees. It's a three-point line as of right now. LSU is a three-point dog at home to the Tennessee Volunteers. The Volunteers are seeking their first 5-0 and start since 2016. Prior to 2016, their last 5-0 and start was back in 1998. Anyone that's watching this knows what happened in 1998 when Tennessee started 5-0. and They won the national championship. The Tennessee is making its first trip to Baton Rouge since 2010. I was still playing. 
in 2010. All right, the Vols were flagged for having 13 players on the field in this game. Y'all remember this? This is wild. It was absolutely wild. They were flagged for having 13 players in the field on the final play of the game. LSU scored the game-winning touchdown on an untimed down. And each of the last three meetings between these games, including 2010, the other games were in 2005 and 2000. Both those games went to overtime. So LSU's won the past five overall meetings. That's the second longest winning streak by either school in series history, Tennessee won 10 straight from 1934 to 1959. So uh, not a, not a really a rivalry game, but it's kind of a wacky one, especially knowing what happened the last time Tennessee went to Baton Rouge. I remember that game vividly. <laughs> Derek Dooley jumping up and down on the sidelines. I can like literally remember it like it was yesterday. Uh, let's talk quickly about Tennessee's offense. They are leading the FBS in total yards, 559 yards per game, and are tied with TCU for second in scoring offense, nearly 49 points per game. So they're just behind Ohio State. Ohio State's at 48.8, TCU and Tennessee, 48.5. So splitting hairs here. Among the best, obviously, when it comes to putting points on the board. When you look at LSU, they've been really good on the defensive side of the football. They really have. They did give up 24 points in its season-opening loss to Florida State. But remember what happened in that game. Dropped a couple uh, punts. You know, bad field position on a few different occasions. And they've won four straight now after that loss. And they haven't allowed more than 17 points in any of those games. Now, they've played some good offenses too. Not not necessarily Auburn. Mississippi State's pretty good. And they held Mississippi State in check, especially there in the second half of that football game. It's the first time since 2012 that LSU has held four straight opponents to 17 or fewer points. And the last time they did so in five straight games was back in 2011. Remember that team? They got to the national championship game, one of the best defenses we've seen in a generation. LSU's offense against Tennessee's defense is where it's going to get really interesting. Jaden Daniels, now he's been a little bit banged up the last couple of weeks. People have said it's a leg. People have said it's a hip. People have said it's a back. Who knows what it is? doesn't matter. I know he's not 100%. Uh, he's riding the bike for quite a while against uh, Auburn there in the second half of that football game. He actually was replaced by Garrett Nussmeyer down the stretch. Could he have returned? I don't know. But either way, if he's not at 100%, that is significant, knowing just how much he's meant to this offense. Not just running it, but throwing it as well. Uh, Daniels and KJ Jefferson are the only SEC quarterbacks with 900 passing yards and 300 rushing yards this year. Meanwhile, when you look at what's going on at wide receiver, Kayshawn Booty, for those that are saying that we're mispronouncing it, it's booty, B-O-O-T-E-E -E is the pronunciation guide chart. So it is Kayshawn Booty, all right? Not Boutte. It used to be Boutte. It changed this offseason. Don't ask me. I don't answer these things. All I can go off is, is the pronunciation guide. It's booty, okay? Kayshawn Booty has returned to the lineup. He missed the game against New Mexico because of the birth of his son. But the guy has not been a factor at any point this year. He's only targeted twice, had a drop, and had only one catch last week for four yards. In three games against FBS opponents this season, he has six catches for 55 yards on 16 targets and has yet to score a touchdown. That's a crazy thought when this way I was an All-American, a consensus All-American coming into the season. He has a 19% drop rate, meaning he is dropping one out of every five balls thrown his way in 2022, which would be the worst rate by any SEC player in a season over the last 10 years. It's pretty wild. In 2021, he dropped only three passes. This year, he's already dropped four. So, And that was on 53 targets last year. This year, four drops in 21 targets. He's got to get things going, man. He's costing himself a lot of money, and he can get it against a Tennessee defense that is very gettable. Hopefully, that offense could get going. The Tennessee Volunteers done a good job of creating pressure, and they do a good job of making sure that their quarterbacks stay, for the most part, corralled. They're the best in the SEC right now. They've created 39% pressure on opponents' dropbacks. That's the best in the SEC and the fifth best in the FBS. On the other side, LSU's been pretty good at protection. They've allowed pressure on only 16% of their dropbacks, which is the best in the SEC and the fifth best in the, S in the FBS. So what gives? Can Tennessee's pass rush get home? Can they create problems for Jaden Daniels? We'll find out. I like LSU in this game. Sounds crazy. The reason why, though, is I'm not sure that Tennessee's been tested. I'm not a believer in Pitt. I'm not a believer yet in Florida. And the fact that Florida went to Tennessee on a special day there in Knoxville 
makes me feel just a little bit uneasy about the fact that this team's capable of going on the road, teeing it up at 11 a.m. and being ready to rock and roll. I think LSU is battle-tested. I think they have the defensive chops to be able to disrupt the rhythm of the Tennessee passing attack. It'll be an amazing game. I can't wait to watch it. Wouldn't be surprised if either team won. I just lean ever so slightly in favor of LSU because of their defensive prowess and how they've played in the first five games of the year on that side of the ball. Where's the hype meter going to be at for LSU if they upset a top 10 team at home? You know, their only loss being a one point opening season fluky loss to Florida State. I mean, they'll be hyped up, but it's not like they're getting a lot of love right now. You know, I mean, this would probably be one of those situations where they'll vault into the top 15 or so. I, I don't know. I mean, they're not going to vault into the top 10. I mean, I think there's, it just depends on how they look. I mean, if they go out and they dominate, then sure. Then I think the people will react strongly to them. But for whatever reason, people are still very much holding a grudge against Brian Kelly. And understandably so, like they haven't really won pretty this year. Uh, The game against Mississippi State was their most complete game. You can make a case uh, that that was their most complete game against quality competition. And there was almost no reaction nationally to that performance. So I think there's some some demons being exercised and some grudges being held against Brian Kelly. I don't think he's very popular amongst AP poll voters. Uh, but if they win this one, I mean, you're going to have to respect what they've accomplished in the first five or six games of the year. All right, now it's time to get to the top five games, the gimme five games that you don't want to miss. All right, these are not the, maybe the five biggest games, but five games that I think are super interesting. Let's start with BYU and Notre Dame. I think I've heard this like 15 times this week because Notre Dame's below BYU. When you look at the box score, this is not in South Bend. All right, this is in Las Vegas. I've seen people saying, well, BYU on the road. Well, on the road, kind of, but it's it's a neutral site, all right? Uh, so just be careful when evaluating that. It's like, oh, man, Notre Dame at home, three and a half points. Like, oh, God, I got to take the Irish. They're not at home, all right? They're in Vegas, all right? So be careful with that. Look, Notre Dame started 0-2. Uh, there's no denying that they didn't look great in the first couple weeks of the season, but the last couple games looked pretty good. Drew Pine's starting to settle in a little bit at quarterback. We know that he replaced Tyler Buckner, and it'll be up to Pine to kind of get this offense going against a good, solid BYU defense. Now, their offense has not necessarily been great, but they did show signs of life against North Carolina a couple weeks ago. Now, BYU's 72nd in rushing, somewhat gettable on the ground. However, if you look at their defense, uh, they gave up kind of a bunch of yards to Laga last week, the Utah State quarterback who was thrust into the lineup. Is that an indicator of poor defense or is that an indicator of the fact that they weren't really prepared for Laga to be the guy? I, I'm not sure. We're going to find out. Uh, I do think that Audric Estime is a guy that you can lean on if you're Notre Dame. Uh, he seemed to break through a little bit against North Carolina. They had 576 yards of total offense. They had 287 yards on the ground. So I do feel like this Notre Dame rushing attack can run the football with enough efficiency to be able to keep a potent BYU offense on the sideline. If you look at this offense, man, for BYU, Jaron Hall's phenomenal threw for 274 and three touchdowns. He's now thrown for nearly 1,500 yards and 12 touchdowns with just one interception on the season. He's going to be going up against, however, one of the better secondaries in the country. This is a really good group in the back end for Notre Dame. When you look at what Notre Dame has been, yes, they're struggling at times offensively, but I do think defensively they can do enough to make life difficult for the BYU Cougars. Look at BYU's defense, like we talked about a second ago. They're 41st in total yards allowed, and they're 18th against the pass, but they've really struggled. They're 92nd against the run, and Utah State just came off a 200-yard performance. Oregon also north of 200 yards. Could be an issue here when you look at Notre Dame with how they're starting to come along on the offensive side. I think they're going to lean on running the football. I think they'll take the ball out of True Pine's hand and they're going to run it as often as they can until BYU could stop it because that does one of two things. One, it wears out BYU's defense. Two, it keeps Jaron Hall and that potent offense off the field. I like Notre Dame in this game. It's not in South Bend, remember. It's a neutral site, but I like the Irish to get it done. I think they have superior personnel. Let's move to game number four. You're going to say, Greg, what are you talking about? This game is so interesting to me. You got Purdue on the road at Maryland. Now, Purdue's offense... 
obviously a different animal when Aiden O'Connell is under center. Now, it wasn't flashy by any stretch of the imagination last year. They, last week, they averaged less than five yards per attempt. 40 attempts, 199 yards, but Aiden O'Connell was coming off that rib injury and looked like he was starting to get a little bit more comfortable as the game went along. Remember, too, I mean, Minnesota came into that game last week playing about as well as anybody in the Big Ten, not named Ohio State. And with Aiden O'Connell coming back, man, it looked like, ah, you know, is he going to be rusty? Is it going to work out? All these other things. I don't know. All I know is he's got a game breaker in Charlie Jones on the outside. The guy has 47 receptions for 588 yards and seven touchdowns to lead the FBS in receiving touchdowns and receptions. He's a burner. And no one really knew, I think, a whole lot about this guy. Kind of came out of nowhere, caught just 39 passes in the last two years. Now, guys burst onto the scene and clearly is going to be an impact player from this point forward for Purdue's offense. Now, Maryland's defense have had their ups and downs, but if you look at their second half performance against Michigan State, zero points allowed in the second half of that football game. So, cautiously optimistic, maybe this group on defense is starting to take some strides, even though it's probably not going to be the group that they hang their hat on. The group that they're going to hang their hat on is the offense. The Terps offensively are no joke, all right? The run game is better. I like what I've seen from Hemby. Antoine Littleton has been a really nice piece, 120 yards last week. We all know that their receivers are off the charts, whether it be Jacob Copeland, whether it be Rakeem Jarrett, whether it be Jashawn Jones. is a really solid corpse of wide receiver. Really, really strong. Defensively, Purdue's very, very good, allowing just 214 yards per game in the air. That's 54th, but they're excellent on the ground. They're averaging just you know, a, a couple a couple of, you know, yards a game on the ground, not giving up a whole lot. They're 316 yards overall given up. It's pretty dang solid. That's 27th nationally. Purdue's about two plays away from being undefeated. Uh, both teams are a little careless with the football. So it's a little bit difficult for me to kind of feel great about that. Purdue will turn it over. So will Maryland. But the problem is Maryland has a few more penalties and is a little bit more undisciplined, but they also have the home field. Give me the Terps. I think they have a little bit more firepower. And I think the Talia Tungabailoa, even though I'm not sure he's at 100% either, the run game and the balance that they'll have offensively is going to be the difference, whereas Purdue is obviously significantly more one-dimensional. Let's move to game number three. I'm not sure why this game isn't getting the coverage it probably deserves, but I love this game. This feels like the Big Ten through and through. Iowa on the road at Illinois. Now, the Hawkeyes have won 16 of the last 19 and 13 of the last 14, including eight in a row. The Illini's last win in the series was in Champaign back in 2008. So it's been a while since the Illini have knocked off the Iowa Hawkeyes. Now, points might be at a premium in this game. All right, the Illini, they lead the Big Ten in scoring defense, allowing just 8.4 points per game. And Iowa's not to be outdone. They're third. They're allowing just 10 points per game. Now, Illinois is yielding the second fewest yards at 229. Hawkeyes are fourth in total defense and allowing 254. So we're talking about great defenses for both teams. The Illini do a lot of things well that set you up well in the Big Ten. They can run the football. All right. They're averaging nearly 200 yards a game on the ground, and they can stop the run. They're allowing just 70 yards per game on the ground. Iowa does those things well as well, does one of those things well. They don't give up much on the ground. They allow just 93 yards per game on the ground, but they're running for just 88 yards per game. So a lot of things to take into account there. Iowa's offense against Illinois' defense. Look, defenses have obviously started to be able to slow down Arlen Bruce a little bit. They're starting to double him, starting to be a little more creative. He hasn't been as much of a factor recently, but you look at the tight ends for Iowa. Very much a factor. They've combined for 15 catches for 222 yards and one touchdown in the last two games. Sam Laporta is the real deal. He has 100 yards in the last couple of games. But Luke Lakey is also starting to become a factor and has first career touchdown, of course, against Michigan. Uh, you look at the Illini. The Illini, I think, excellent on the deep side of the football where they're really, really good. It's right up the middle, man. These two defensive tackles can flat out get after you. If you don't know these names by now, you need to learn them. Johnny Newton. Keith Randolph are for real. They've combined for 40 quarterback pressures at defensive tackle. That's the most in the country by any interior defensive line tandem. Newton by himself leads the nation in quarterback hits with 12 and is tied for the national lead in quarterback pressures with 28. 
Randolph, meanwhile, leads the Illini in total tackles. How many times does a defense tackle lead a defense in total tackles? Don't hear that very often. Tackles for loss, six and a half, and is tied with Newton for the team leading sacks. He's got three sacks. So he also has interception, I might add, too. So these defensive tackles, they can wreak havoc there up front along the line of scrimmage for the Illini defense. Let's talk about Illinois' offense for a hot second against Iowa's defense. We all know what Iowa's defense is. They're the only reason why they've been in games really the last few weeks. They've been excellent on that side of the ball. I think this might be the best test that they've seen so far, potentially, and some people might disagree with that. People say, well, Corum or whatever, fine. Chase Brown, to me, has played as well as any running back in college football. You know, B. John Robinson, Blake Corum, you know, and Chase Brown would probably be the top top three at running back so far this year. It might be missing one or two, so forgive me if I am. But off the top of my head, those are kind of the three running backs that have really stood out. Right now, he leads uh, the Big Ten in yards per game on the ground, Chase Brown does, at 146.6. And he's also the nation's leading rusher. Okay. He also has the most rushes of 10 plus yards. He's got 25 of those. That's six more than any other player. All right. He's tied for fourth uh, in college football with 20 plus yard runs. He's got seven of those. And he's tied for second in 30 plus yard runs. He's got four of those. So if you look at where they're at, he's also the first Illini player ever to rush for 100 plus in six straight games. The guy's the real deal. He is the real deal. And then Isaiah Williams, I think, is really solid. Pat Bryant. Very solid. Those are two good weapons on the outside. And Tommy DeVito looks very comfortable under center for the Illini. I like Illinois here. I think they got a little bit too much offense. And I think their defense is really underrated. When you watch those two guys up front, they will destroy you. Be very, very careful when running it up the middle against those defensive tackles for the Illini. Let's go next to game number two and game number one, both of which coming to us courtesy of the Big 12. Kansas State on the road at Iowa State. Kansas State's offense. Let's start with them against Iowa State's defense. Strength versus strength. Who the heck is this guy that is playing quarterback for Kansas State? Adrian Martinez looks like a different dude this year, man. Nine rushing touchdowns coming off of a career high 171 rushing yards last week. Now, for what he does, I mean, is there anyone right now playing better than Adrian Martinez over the last two weeks? All right, against Oklahoma and Texas Tech, he's hitting 62% of his passes. He's never going to be a super pure thrower either, by the way. But he's been very accurate throwing the football by his standards. A couple touchdowns, no picks. Yet to throw an interception this year and has rushed in the last two weeks for 319 yards and two touchdowns. Or, and seven touchdowns, excuse me. That's in the last two games. That is impressive stuff from Adrian Martinez. Alongside him is Deuce Vaughn. We all know what he is, all right? 638 rushing yards so far this year. That's third in the FBS. You throw in the 286 rushing yards from Deuce Vaughn over the last two weeks. You got Adrian Martinez at 319, 286 from Deuce Vaughn. That's a fairly potent attack there for Kansas State running the football. When you look at Iowa State's defense, I might add, it's the best in the Big 12 against the run. They're not really allowing a whole lot through the air either, but... When you look at total defense and scoring defense, they're legit. However, they're 3-0 and when allowing less than 100 rushing yards. They're 0-2 when they allow more than 100 rushing yards. Both Baylor and Kansas went for over 100 rushing yards. I think it's fairly obvious to me that Kansas State is going to go north of the century mark when it comes to running the football. Because good as Iowa State's defense is, they're not forcing a ton of turnovers lately. Came up with three Inter three turnovers against Iowa. That was, of course, in kind of rough conditions. They had four turnovers against Ohio. But in the last two games, they've had just one turnover. I think this is a really impressive game when it comes to the defense. Two of the lowest scoring teams in the Big 12. Two of the best scoring defenses in the Big 12. What gives? Give me the hot quarterback. Give me the elite running back. I like Kansas State to get it done on the road. I don't love it but I definitely like it. And then finally, game number one of the five games you don't want to miss. Game day will be there. What more could you ask for? TCU, who's undefeated at Kansas, who's undefeated. Who didn't see this one coming? Battle of unbeatens here in October. For the first time ever, college game day is heading to Kansas. There are now just seven Power Five teams that have never hosted game day. Can you name them? 
I'll give you about two seconds. All right. Duke, you probably guessed. All right. Rutgers, you probably guessed. Syracuse, Virginia. And then some that were a little bit more surprising. Illinois, Maryland, and Cal. That to me is shocking. Now that Kansas's box is checked, only seven Power 5 teams remain that have yet to host College Game Day. Anyone else surprised that they haven't been to Syracuse, which is like the home of Broadcast World, and Maryland, which is where SVP's from? I was kind of surprised, but what do I'm I I'm not know? surprised about Syracuse now. <laughs> well, Syracuse, I guess it's kind of tough to go to Syracuse there and do an outdoor show and, you know, beyond October 10th. So if you're going to get it in, better be the first six weeks. But hey, no. Hey, Dino's got the boys playing, 5-0. and Maybe they can continue a hot streak. Maybe they'll check another one off here in a couple of weeks. And hey, Duke's pretty good. They're sitting atop the coaster right now. They're undefeated in the league. Maybe they end up at Duke later this year as well. Hey, Maryland's playing well too. Why not? Let's just check everybody off this year. Let's do it. Virginia, probably not going to get it this year. Rutgers, probably not going to get it this year. Cal, probably not going to get it this year. Illinois is pretty good. There's a lot of options here. A lot of options this year to potentially check off a box for college game day. All right. The Jayhawks are the Cinderella team. In college football, they're five and zero for the first time since two thousand nine. Their five victories this year are their most in a season since two thousand nine. Here's what's crazy though: in two thousand nine, they started five and zero. They finished five and seven. Um, so be careful. All right, let's celebrate it right now because you never know just how quickly these things can slip away. Uh, you think about it: five wins this year. It actually matches the amount of wins they had from 2019 to 2021. They were 5-28 and 28 in that stretch. If they win this week, it will be Kansas's fourth 6-0 and start to start a season in 100 years. It's amazing when you really think about where they're at. Let's talk about Kansas's offense against TCU's defense. Kansas had a great start because of what Jalen Daniels is doing. And the guy leads the FBS in total QBR. 16 touchdowns responsible for are the most by a Big 12 player and the most by any FBS player with one or fewer turnovers. He's also been a huge threat with his legs too. Don't discount the fact that he could create an awful lot with his legs. Currently, he's one of just four Power 5 quarterbacks this season with 900 pass yards and 300 rush yards. KJ Jefferson is one. Jaden Daniels at LSU is the other. Malik Cunningham at Louisville is the third. He is, of course, the fourth. The TCU defense, not bad. Not great, but not bad. The TCU offense, however, is the real deal. Look, Sonny Dykes is an offensive mastermind. No one's really that surprised at them scoring an awful lot of points. Uh, they have completely exploded, like we talked about earlier. They're tied with Tennessee, scoring 48.5 points a game. And they're just behind Ohio State. The big reason why is because Max Duggan's been phenomenal. He's third right now in total QBR behind C.J. Stroud and the aforementioned Jaden Daniels. Jalen Daniels, excuse me. So this is the real deal quarterback type of matchup, man. Can TCU go on the road to Kansas and get the win? At some point, Kansas is going to come back to earth. They did a great job last week defensively. Can that continue? I have a difficult time thinking so. I think if TCU goes in there and is reading their press clippings and feeling really, really confident about what they did last week against Oklahoma, if they come out flat, they're in trouble. I just don't think they will. I think this offense will play well. I think it'll be a difficult environment, believe it or not. It's the third straight sell it that Kansas has had there at their stadium. So kudos to their fans for really supporting what's been one of the great stories in college football up to this point. I think they'll have a great game. I think they'll play well. I think they'll play hard. I just think they're going to come up a little bit short because I think TCU just has more talent across the board. I lean Horned Frogs, but I lean Horned Frogs really, really close in one of the best games of the weekend. All right. Awesome. Love getting into some of those games. Love getting into some of the numbers that support one side or the other. We hope you enjoy it too, man. I'll break these games down all day long. I just love it. I freaking love it. Uh, that's what we do it for, man. It's for these incredible matchups and that's why we love the game. That's why we love the sport. And we hope that you're enjoying the breakdowns as much as we enjoy giving them to you. And we're not hitting all the treetop games. And well, what, does it, you know, what does this mean for Jimbo versus Bant? Like that game's a 24-point spread. Like you can get that breakdown anywhere. Sorry we didn't give it to you today. All right. 
oh, well, what does Georgia need to do? Georgia's a 30-point favorite. You know, you, you could get those breakdowns anywhere. So we hope that you Purdue fans and you Maryland fans and you Illinois fans and all these other people that don't get talked about enough, we hope you're getting it here when you tune in to Always College Football. Please like, rate, and subscribe. We appreciate it, man. It helps us out. It helps the show out. We look forward to continuing to talk about these matchups here each and every week from this point forward. We're here with you every single day. Not Saturdays, not Sundays, but every other day we're here. And we're actually here on Sundays when coaches get fired. So we're here, you know, probably see you on Sunday, uh, depending on how things go. Um, here at a few different places whose coaches are currently sitting on a very, very hot seat. We really appreciate it, man. Tell your friends. Hit us up in our social media at Always CFB. Hit us up in our email at Always College Football at gmail.com. For all of us here at Always College Football, for Jack, for Jack, for Coobs, I'm Greg. We hope you have a wonderful weekend. And remember, it's Always College Football. Hey guys, it's Greg McElroy. Thanks for watching Always College Football. Make sure you like, rate, and subscribe to ESPN's YouTube channel and wherever you listen to your podcasts.